Chapter 4 Soil Hawk Kars awoke with a slight feeling of nausea and the smell of the drug faint in his nostrils. He found he was lying on the floor of a large square cell whose walls and ceiling were of some burnished brown metal and which was bare of any kind of furnishing. In one wall was a tightly closed door, also of metal and studded by the knob of a lock. Barred slits, high in opposite walls, gave ventilation. A single tube set in the ceiling provided illumination. He was not bound. He sat up and regarded the outflung figure of Friday lying to one side. Something in his look seemed to reach the giant negro, for, as he watched, the man's eyelids flickered and a sigh escaped his full lips. He stared up at Curse, recognition followed by gladness flooding his eyes. The hawk smiled also. There were close bonds between these two. Lord, I'm sure thankful to be with you, sir, said the negro with relief. His eyes rolled as he took in the cabin-like cell. Humph, nice homey little place, he remarked. Where do you reckon we are, sir? I think we're at last at that place we have searched so long for. Kusui's headquarters, his own spaceship. It will be remembered by those who have read their history that the Eurasians' actual base of operations was, for a long time, the greatest of the mysteries that enveloped him. Half a dozen times had the hawk and his comrade-in-arms, Elliot Lethgow, hunted for it with all their separate skill of adventurer and scientist. And although they had twice found the man himself, always they had failed to find his actual retreat. For those who are unacquainted with the histories of that raw period a hundred years ago, it will be impossible to understand the spell of fear which accompanied mention of Dr. Ku throughout the universe, a fear engendered chiefly by the man's unpredictable comings and goings, thanks to his secret hiding place. Those who were as close to him as henchmen could be, which was not very close, only added to the general mystery of the whereabouts of the base by their sincerely offered but utterly contradictory notions and data. One thing all agreed on. The outlaw's lair was a place most frightening. Therefore, it can be understood why, on hearing the hawk's opinion, Friday's face fell somewhat. Guess that means we're finished, sir, he opined moodily. Cars had walked to the lone door and found, as he of course expected, that it was tightly locked. He responded crisply, It's not like you to talk that way, Eclipse. We're far from that. We have succeeded in the first step, if, as I suspect, this cell is part of Dr. Ku's real headquarters, and surely before he decides to eliminate us, we will be able to learn something of the nature of his spaceship. Perhaps how it can be attacked and conquered. Conversation always cheered the naturally social Friday. He seldom had the opportunity for it with his usually curt master. He objected. But what good'll that do us, sir, if we take what we've learned to where it won't help anybody, least of all us? And what chance we got against Kusui now when we're prisoners? Why, he's a magician! It ain't natural what he does. Lands in our ship, plop right out of empty space? Puts us out with a wave of his handkerchief? With final misery in his voice, he added, We're sunk, sir. This time we surely are. Kars smiled at his emotional friend. All you need is a good fight, Eclipse. It's thinking that disintegrates your morale. You should never try to think. Why? There was an anesthetic on that handkerchief. Simple enough. I might have expected it. As for his getting into our ship, he entered from behind, through the afterport lock, while we were looking for his ship on the Vizzy screen. I don't understand yet why we could not see his craft. It's too much to suppose he could make it invisible. Paint, perhaps, or camouflage. 
he might have a way of preventing, from a distance, the registering of his ship on our screen. Oh, he's dangerous, clever, deep. But somewhere there'll be a loophole. Somewhere there always is. His tone changed and he snapped. Now be quiet, I want to think. His face stiffened into a cold, calm mask. But behind his gray eyes lay anything but calmness. Ku Sui's easy assumption that the information as to Elliot Lethgow's whereabouts would be forthcoming from his lips puzzled him, brought real anxiety. Torture would probably not be able to force his tongue to betray his friend, but there were perhaps other means. Of these, he had a vague and ominous apprehension. Dr. Ku was preeminently a specialist in the human brain. He had implied his will to have that information. Suppose he should use something it was impossible to fight against. And he alone, Hawk Kars, brought the responsibility. I need, like, some music for him, you know, like the horses for Frau Blucher. Hawk Kars! Da -da -da! <laughs> Every time they say his full name. Brought the responsibility. He had asked Lethgow where he would be, and he remembered well the place agreed upon. He dared not lose the battle of wits he knew was coming. His eyes shot to the door. It was opening. In a moment, Ku Sui stood revealed there, and behind him in the corridor were three other figures their yellow, coolie faces strangely dumb and lifeless above the tasteful gray smocks, which extended a little below their belted waists. Each bore embroidered on his chest the planetary insignia of Ku Sui in yellow, and each was armed with two ray guns. I must ask forgiveness, my friend, for these retainers who accompany me. The Eurasian began suavely. Please don't let them disturb you, however. They are more robots than men, obeying only my words. A little adjustment of the brain, you understand. I have brought them only for your protection, for you would find it would result most unpleasantly to make a break for freedom. Of course, you're not the one who wants protection sneered Friday with devastating sarcasm, or else you'd have brought a whole army. But the negro paled a little when the Oriental's green tiger eyes caught him full. It was with a physical shock, such was the power of the man, that he received the soft-spoken reply. Yours is a most subtle and entertaining wit black one. I am overcome with the honor and pleasure of having you for my guest. But perhaps may I suggest that you save your humor for a more suitable occasion. I would like to make the last few hours of your visit as pleasant as possible. He turned to Hawk Kars. I have thought that an inspection of this, my home in space, would intrigue you more than anything else my poor hospitality affords. May I do you the honor, my friend? You are too good to me, the hawk replied frostily. I will duplicate your kindness some day. The Eurasian bowed. After you, he said, and waited until Friday and the hawk passed first through the door. Close after them came the three automatons of yellow men. My eye is twitching already. <laughs> no. The passageway was square, plain, and bare, and spaced at intervals by other closed doors. Stall rooms in this wing, the Eurasian explained as they progressed. He stopped in front of one of the doors and pressed a button beside it. It slid noiselessly open, revealing not another room, but a short metal spider ladder. Up this they climbed, one of the guards going first in the half-darkness. Then a trap door above opened to douse them with warm, ruddy light. They stepped out. 
and the scene that met them took them completely off guard. Friday gasped, and Carse so far lost his habitual poise as to stare in wonder. Soil and a great glassy dome. Not a spaceship, this realm of Kusui. Soil, soil with a whole settlement built upon it. Hard, grayish soil, and on it several buildings of the familiar burnished metal. And overhead, cupping the entire outlay, arched a great hemisphere of what resembled glass, ribbed with silvery supporting beams and struts, an enormous bowl turned down, and on its other side the glorious vista of space. Straight above hung the red-belted disk of Jupiter, with the pale globes of satellites two and three wheeling close. And all of them were the same relative size they had appeared when last seen from the scorpion. Dr. Koo smiled unctuously at the puzzlement that showed on the faces of his captives. Have you noticed, he asked, that you are still in the neighborhood of this spot in space where we had our rendezvous? But this isn't another of Jupiter's satellites. Ah, no. This is my own world. My own personally controlled little world. Snakes of the Santo! Friday gasped, the whites of his eyes showing all around. Then we must be on an asteroid! <laughs> They were. From the far side of the dome ahead of them, the asteroid stretched back hard and sharp in Jupiter's ruddy light against the backdrop of black space. It was a craggy, uneven body, seemingly about twenty miles in length, pinched in the middle and thus shaped roughly like a peanut shell. One end had been leveled off to accommodate the dome with its cradled buildings, Outside the dome, all was untouched. The landscape was a gargantuan jumble of coarse, hard, sharp rocks, which had crystallized into a maze of hollows, crevices, long, crazy splits, and jagged, outthrusting lumps of boulders. Without an atmosphere, with but the feeblest of gravities and utterly without any form of life, save for that within the dome built upon it, it was simply a typical small asteroid, of which race only the largest are globe-shaped. Once, the Eurasian went on softly as they took all this in, this world of mine circled with its thousands of fellows between Mars and Jupiter. I picked it from the rest because of certain mineral qualities and had this air-containing dome constructed on it and these buildings inside the dome. Then, with batteries of gravity plates inserted precisely in the asteroid's center of gravity, I nullified the gravitational pull of Mars and Jupiter, wrenched it from its age-old orbit, and swung it free into space. An achievement that would command the respect even of Elliot Lithgow, I think. So, now you see, Cars. Now you know. This is my secret base. This my hidden laboratory. I take it always with me, and I travel where I will. The hawk nodded coldly his acceptance of the astounding fact. He was too busy to make comment. He was observing the buildings, the nature of them, the exits from the dome, how they could best be reached. They stood on the roof of the largest and central building, a low metal structure with four wings, crossing at right angles to make the figure of a great plus mark. The hub was probably Dr. Koo's chief laboratory, Kars conjectured. On each side stood other buildings, low, long, like barracks, with figures of coolies moving in and out. Workshops, living quarters, power rooms, he supposed. Power rooms, certainly, for a soft hum filled the air. There were two great port locks at ground level in the dome, one on each side, 
each sizable enough to admit the largest spaceship, and each flanked by a smaller, man-sized lock. To reach them... And over there, Dr. Ku's voice broke in, you see your borrowed ship, the Scorpion. But please don't let it tempt you to cut short your visit with me, my friend. It would avail you nothing even if you reached her, for it requires a secret combination to open the port locks, and my servants' brains have been so altered that they are physically incapable of divulging it to you. And, of course, I have offensive rays and other devices hidden about, just in case. All rather hopeless, isn't it? But surely interesting. Let us go. I have more. Below, in my main laboratory in the center of this building, there's something far more interesting, and it concerns you, Commerce, and me, and also Master Scientist Elliot Lithgow. He let the words sink in. Will you follow me? And so they went below again, down the spider ladder into the corridor. There was nothing else to do. The guards, ever watchful, pressed close behind. But a tattoo of alarm was beating in Hawk Curse's brain. Da da da! Elliot Leafgow again, the hint of something ominous to be aimed at him. Carse, for the extraction of information he alone possessed. The whereabouts of his elderly friend, the Master Scientist. Da-da-da!